Well, good evening. The bewitching hour of seven o'clock has, has arrived. 7.02, thank you, Robert. And uh, welcome to those who are in the room, actually a slightly smaller group than the last few weeks, and to a much larger number of people who are online, and then to others who will be watching the recording. Um, before we, we start, is there, uh, who's here for the first time, not necessarily forever, but the first time for a while? I know Beth is. <laughs> oh, come on, you're a regular. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. You, you were here showing us 3D printers only a couple of months ago. You can't claim to be a newbie, ex president. <laughs> I'm new. <laughs> but, but welcome. Sorry. No, I hope so. Okay. Um, uh, tonight we have uh, a guest speaker, Michelle, who, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll have questions after her talk and uh, then a coffee break and I think we will have a little raffle which we will draw during the coffee break. People who are online can organise their own raffle and coffee. And uh, after that, uh, uh, Hugh, we normally have the President's report but Hugh was indisposed unfortunately and we wish him well. Uh, so that won't happen. But then uh, we, uh, uh, tonight uh, and in subsequent nights, we're going to feature a different aspect of the club's activities, uh, uh, either an activity that takes place here or, or uh, uh, the special interest groups. We've uh, been used to having the iHelp people give us a talk every time, but uh, they will take their turn now along with other uh, features of, of the club. So that's, that's the way we're heading into the future. So, having said that, I'd like to introduce Michelle. And I need to read this. Michelle has 15 years experience, which means she started at the age of 10. Oh. <laughs> charming, <laughs> Gary, very charming. Um, 15 years experience in online media, online media and communications, following a career in advertising, event management and PR. And for the past 10 years, she has worked as a digital strategist, working across integrated digital assets, including social media, websites, apps, and emerging technologies and integrated campaigns, including experiential. Experiential. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, uh, activities and events. She led the communications team for Zoe Daniel MPs. Zoe, is that how you say? Yep. Zoe Daniel MPs successful election campaign in 2022. Continues to work with Zoe. She's also a committed volunteer for a range of community-based groups, organisations, including music and culture. So that's Michelle. And Michelle, over to you. Thank and you. thank you. Thank you, David and Kirsten, for inviting me along here tonight. I do need to stand on the mic. I have been told that. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the land on which we are meeting and working here tonight, which is the land of the Bunurung people. And uh, thank you for having me. So my presentation tonight is what to know about social media platforms today, which I've been asked to present. Next, Kirsten. Where are we? There's, there's slide one. Oh, there we go. There's my name on it too. So I thought that we would just do a bit of an overview on platforms because there's some new ones, there's some old ones, there's ones you'll know, there's ones you may not know, and I'll just tell you where they're at now and then take questions. But I will barrel through each one of them and then we'll take those questions afterwards because there's a fair bit to get through. Thanks. Next. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to the presentation. We're going to delve into some of the most popular 
social media platforms and have a look at some of their characteristics and understand who's using them. And I'd be very happy to hear from you um, how you might want to use them or if you've got any thoughts about that. And I've also chosen some kind of good practice accounts from Melbourne for us to have a look at and also and just some examples from around the world of what people are doing on some of these platforms. Next. So what does the landscape look like here in Australia? I'll just take you now through a fascinating graph, thank you, of Australia's favourite social media platforms. And this is the active social media users aged 16 to 64. Obviously there's plenty of social media users that are also older than that, but this gives you an idea. Facebook still number one, about 24% of um, people say it's their favourite platform. Instagram, you may or may not know it, close to 20% of people there. TikTok, you may have heard of this one, it's the hot new thing, 12% um, of people are saying they love that. Facebook Messenger, which is the messaging app that goes with Facebook, there's a lot of people using that. Then there's another messaging app called WhatsApp, which is also owned by Facebook. There's a platform called Snapchat, there's iMessage, there's Reddit, there's Twitter, and there's Pinterest. So this just gives you an idea. The big boys are Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, along with the associated messaging apps. Next. So, what do we need to know most about it? They're diverse, there's lots of them, and they're becoming more and more fragmented. Um, they're highly active, they've got big numbers of users every, every month, and they're mostly on mobile. They're now designed to be able to use on mobile on your handheld device, particularly your phone. So we have lots of different users, lots of different demographics, but there's plenty of things in common that you'll start to understand. So there's also, I wanted to touch on this evening, some of the emerging alternative platforms that are starting to come to life now. Um, they're often designed to democratise social media. And that is to allow users freedom from the uh, algorithms of the big social media giants you may have read about or heard about uh, wherever you consume your own media. Each platform, has got unique features and they serve different purposes but they give opportunities to businesses and to individuals to connect with their audiences so it's all about connection and Australians love social media since it first came into being we have embraced it with absolute vigour many people are on social so they can't even remember their life without it so you may know some people like this. Um, but the biggest change that I wanted to talk about in the last five years is that socials are better on mobile, which is interesting, talking to a group called the PC Users Group, um, because that means that um, it's, all, it's all happening in here uh, rather than here, which is not a PC either. However, um, most of these social media platforms not only are designed for this, they've got more features on this as well. So you can do more with them on the mobile than you can on the desktop. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and even more importantly than, than that is that video is the content that people love. Um, it's the content winner if you're looking to get attention. People love it. It moves, it's appealing and these phones are designed to capture images and video. It, people mostly use them, people use them as much for their, their camera as they do for a phone these days. So one other thing to note that I think is interesting for you to be aware of is that people are drifting away from traditional news sources, so the, the television, the radio, and they're they're also drifting away from the traditional news companies that we may be accustomed to, whether it's our ABC or whether, wherever you get your news from. And they're using social media instead. And they use it for search purposes as much as they use it for just scrolling through and looking at content. 
So it may surprise you to learn that um, some of these social media platforms are also now the second and third biggest search engines in the Western world. So um, you can also imagine, those of you that have worked in development in any way, that many of those, there'd be a significant investment in search in each of those platforms. So next one. Why is it all about mobile? Well, my goodness, look at us. We have 33.59 million mobile phone connections in Australia. That's more than the number of Australians. So people have got more than one phone. Um, the number of phones compared with the population, 126.4%. So something like 25% of us have more than one phone. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and what's the year on year change in the number of connections? It's going up. It went up by another 500,000 last year. And how many of them have broadband connection, which means they can look at three, they've got 3G, 4G or 5G connections. Uh, that's 100%. So why are developers investing in mobile apps and why are platforms investing in mobile? It's because that's what we do now. So now I'm going to take you into a little bit of a description and the key characteristics and some understanding of who uses each of these platforms. So just calling around the room, who uses Facebook? And in our online group, I can't see you, sorry. Lots of Facebook users. Lots of Facebook users. Let's do it the other way around. Who's not using Facebook? <laughs> okay. Okay. So Facebook, as, as you saw earlier, it's, it's one of our most widely used social media platforms. There's around 1,500 million monthly users. That's as of the end of last year. Um, the emphasis on Facebook is on visual content including photos and videos, um, and two other new formats on Facebook called Reels and Stories. Um, these are shorter form, stories are a short form post that lasts for 24 hours and then it disappears. And Reels are vertical videos that um, people feel completely compelled to tell us everything about their lives on. Uh, <laughs> hey. And the cats, all sorts of things. Um, the emphasis on Facebook, believe it or not, is actually on community. Uh, for those of us as users, it, it offers a, a feature called groups, it offers a feature called events, and it offers messaging to the people that you're in touch with. And many organisations and businesses and education uh, and how-to groups use Facebook groups as a way to communicate, trade knowledge, um, do uh, explainers and how-tos and swap and share information and, and assist one another. Um, and there are also commercial business models that offer access to a Facebook group if you pay a higher subscription fee for their special knowledge. So um, one of the most frequently used ones of those is people training people on believe it or not, social media, <laughs> on how to use social media and, and digital marketing. Excuse me, water break. But more than anything, Facebook is an adver advertising platform. Um, those of you that have been on it and may have had anything to do with Customer, rela customer relationship management, anything to do with databases, anything to do with, you know, frankly, even a spreadsheet, will notice fairly quickly that you can reverse engineer it as being one great big fat spreadsheet of your likes, interests, demographics, hobbies, etc., which makes it an ideal advertising platform for people that want to advertise because you can highly target people based on their age, their 
shoes they like, where they've clicked, what they shop for, the movies they like, etc. So it's a rich company and it is becoming increasingly more expensive to advertise and get attention on Facebook. So um, who's using Facebook? Majority, slim majority, is women, 53%, um, which means 47% are not women. Um, strangely enough, <laughs> people aged 25 to 34 are still the largest user group on a monthly basis. And the highest difference between men and, men and women occurs within people aged 65 and above where women lead by nearly more than a million monthly users than men. So what's interesting about that, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, people use Facebook for connections to family, to see what the family's up to. Um, you know, there are plenty of men I know, including the one I'm married to, who says, well, without my wife, I wouldn't probably have a social life because she organises all that. <laughs> um, we're traditionalists in that respect. And I think possibly that might be one of the reasons why there's slightly more women. They're being, you know, they're doing the family organisation, doing those sorts of things. And then I thought we could have a look at a couple of next one. Thanks, Kirsten. A couple of examples of good practice from Melbourne. And by good practice, what I mean is organisations or individuals that are using the platform uh, with all of its features to be able to connect with their audience. Um, this one is called Broadsheet Melbourne. It's actually a, it's a food, wine, culture, rag, I suppose, publication. And if we can, can we click through? Yep. Oh, beauty. Um, am I live on Facebook? I am. Okay. So if you go and have a click, um, please, Kirsten, on um, reels first, that'd be great. Go up here. No. Have a look there. Let's see what they're producing. So these are those vertical videos that I was telling you about. And let's play the second one. Yes. So this is about design. <laughs> and dogs. So believe it or not, people watch that. Um, they love to love to look at the staff. Dusty's, uh, they've managed to include everything there that people are remotely interested in. We've got an artist, a creator. We've got someone who's showing us what they do. We've got cats. We've got, we've got pets. We've got a beautiful home. We've got a young person telling us about their life. And this is the sort of content that gets attention from people. So Broadsheet have obviously gone out and found themselves a local creator and created a story about it. So the thing with stories and reels and Facebook is it's about storytelling and this is what people are doing there. Um, uh, I have seen probably thousands of hours of this sort of stuff so I, I could not care less about what's going on in her life. However, um, Millions of people do. How many have liked it? It's something like a thousand people, 1,100 people went, oh, I love what she's doing there. There's, there's thousands of comments. People have got something to say about it. But what that tells us too is that people are interested in what other people are doing. Tell them a story and they'll pay attention. There's another one there that I've got for you, which is Zoo's Victoria, but you'll get the picture very quickly. Again, they're using photos, they're using stuff that's highly appealing. They're animals, their shows, their events, to attract people to them and let them know what they're doing and sell tickets. That's what they're up to there. I will, you can go and have a look at these after the fact, otherwise we'll never get through this, I've just realised. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of local local examples of an institution that we've all, we all know about and also a, a publication that younger people are definitely interested in. Next, we'll move on to Instagram. Again, who is using Instagram in the room? Is it one? What about in online? Okay, quite a few Instagram users. 
So Instagram is different to Facebook in that it was built for mobile. Facebook was first built for desktop. <coughs> it's, a, it's a photo streaming platform, basically, that allows you um, some words to describe your photo, but it's, so it's visual centric. It's popular amongst younger people. It's best used on a mobile as the features definitely uh, uh, are better executed on a mobile. And <coughs> if you wanna jump onto Instagram and learn what those features are, go and search how to create content on Instagram, on Instagram, because there will be a thousand people out there making videos, showing you how to make videos. So that's a really great way to get in there and their search, their search engine inside there is pretty good. So what are the key characteristics? Um, it's the focus is literally visual. They run stories and reels and a thing called IGTV where you can actually broadcast out of, out of Instagram and have multiple people watch you. It's highly interactive. It's got, if you're running a commercial site, <coughs> it's got polls, it's got Q&A, it's got shopping tags. It can, you can link it straight to your e-commerce site. You can cross post post to Facebook, they're owned by the same owner. So if you post on Instagram, you can, you can choose a setting to say post to Facebook, so it's efficient. So you can do it that way, particularly if you're running a business. Um, the big thing it doesn't have is you can't put hyperlinks in the posts. Uh, so you can't, you can't do link content. If you're a shop or you're running a, a business, you can pay a fee that allows people to link more easily to your website, but the free model does not let you post links. Um, so on Instagram, you will quite often see something that says, see link in bio. You're like, what is that? Why am I looking at a link in your bio? I'm already on your account. It's because what Instagram does do is allow third party developers to use their API to create link apps. So you can go up there, click a live link in there and drop all of your links that you want to onto the link in bio. It's clumsy, but uh, that's how people use it. So I've given you also an example there of Linktree that it's a free app that allows users to add links to their accounts so that users can read more. So again, uh, 14 odd million Instagram users in Australia last April, May. So more than 50% of us are using Instagram. The majority are women, nearly 56%. And again, the largest user group is those 25 to 34 year olds. They are dead keen on using their social media. Also, if you think about it, <coughs> they've, they've barely grown up without it. They are exactly the age group that the minute they were, you know, 13 or 14, they were seeing social media. And the highest difference between men and women in that group occurs for women between 35 and 44, where women lead by about 1.1 million users a month. That one is probably to do with shopping um, and being able to research, compare, do those sorts of things and, and or maybe find out about Poppy and her dogs and her glass blowing or whatever, because she'll be on there too, for sure. Um, so that's Instagram. It's worth having a look at because so many people use it and you've probably got people in your family using it. They may have shown you things on their phone that's on Instagram. There's some really good, interesting, serious accounts on Instagram as well, but there's also a lot of influencers. This is where they, they really live, um, where they'll be modelling clothes, makeup, uh, f furniture, <laughs> home decor, uh, and, and explaining to you how they do all of those things. So they get paid to promote things on Instagram. Yeah, okay, yeah. so some examples of good practice from Melbourne. Um, okay, so there's some, the other thing about Instagram is that it's funny. 
there can be some extremely funny things there. I don't think that link is going to work, Kirsten. We have to go and use that other one I emailed you. So a couple of years ago, there's – who does anyone catch the train? There's um, – so at Flinders Street Station, there's a guy that calls the trains and says, stand back from the platform. Uh, this guy called Lawrence. So Lawrence started an Instagram account and one of his friends took videos of him because he's very amusing. Um, and he's the platform caller at Flinders Street. He went absolutely viral with his unique use of the microphone and what he does there. He's now pursuing an additional career as a singer and uh, performer and comedian. Um, I'm hoping that we can show you a little bit of why. Try that one. Stop now. Anyway, you get the idea there. He created this kind of sensation. All the major media stations uh, started to follow him and uh, he has – he's built up this very, very, very huge audience. So funnily enough, Lawrence doesn't need to work as the platform caller at Flinders Street Station anymore. Uh, Lawrence is getting job offers to appear with bands on stage um, and, and announce them on there. Um, and then another one that I've given you, and again, we won't go through this one tonight, but an, um, it's just the Visit Melbourne site, which features stunning video and photography. Um, another one for others in the room who might be called women is a woman called Celeste Barber. Uh, we might go and find her. She's just got the lazy 9.5 million followers. Celeste tries to copy what influencers do. Anyway, it just gets funnier and funnier because there are absolutely ludicrous influencer accounts of people trying to do crazy things. So Celeste's whole shtick is that she tries to do it at home and she tries to do it using her own wardrobe. And she's, she's, a, she's a trained comedian and actor it's a, uh, and, and dancer, but she's found a little niche in that world there. And she's now had two TV series on Netflix, she's, um, you know, she sells out wherever she goes. She also raised $50 million during the bushfires in New South Wales. So um, when we talk about influence on Instagram, it can be ridiculously large and I can see the stunned faces of some people here just going, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I'm not, unfortunately. This is what people are interested in. All of the celebrities she takes the Mickey out of um, love that she does it. So as soon as she imitates them, they're all over her Instagram account saying, that's fantastic, can we do some more, please? So there you go. There's, there's, there's some, of, some of the ways that people are using these platforms to entertain one another. Next, I'm going to take you to an account, to one called mm, Threads. So Threads is also owned by Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram. Threads was set up as a Twitter competitor in July 2023. It got off to a stro it got 100 million sign-ups within a week. The week was the same week – well, it wasn't very long after a fellow called Elon Musk decided to buy Twitter. Um, and a lot of people wanted to jump off Twitter because they didn't particularly agree with Elon. He also started charging people to use uh, some features of Twitter. So what are the key characteristics of threads? It's short form. You need an Instagram account to, to, to have a threads account. You've got to have the, both of them. You can cross post from Instagram. Uh, huzzah, you can actually now do hyperlinks using threads. So you can link to, if you've written an article or you've got something you want to share, you can actually link to a website. Um, unlike Twitter, it's got a few more characters that you can use. There's a 500 character limit. You can use text, photos, videos, links, whatever. Um, as I've always said about Twitter anyway, yes, you've got a 240 character, 288 character limit plus the whole internet if you include a, a link in there. So um, it's not that limited. And the other thing about Threads, it's new. It's barely been a year. Um, so they're having regular featured updates and rollouts. And what is happening to that audience in there is that they're rising Whenever they introduce a rollout, the founders issue a challenge to people to use it. 
and users are embracing that to find out how to do it. So it's friendlier, it's nicer, it's more polite, it's not as rude, it's not as obnoxious as Twitter has become. Um, who are the users? People who hate Twitter. Um, Threads doesn't publish a lot of information about its demographics. You know, um, we do know it's had 265 million downloads since July, and that only seems to be increasing. April, they still they were they will tell us how many downloads they've got, but they won't tell us much more. Um, they've said that they've got 130 million active users every month. Compare that to Twitter, which has got apparently 550 million. So the most popular accounts on threads are celebrities, but lots of politicians, lots of serious people, thought leaders and others are also using threads. Journalists and media outlets have now turned to threads as an alternative to Twitter. And some mainstream media companies have actually completely jumped off Twitter because they found it unmanageable in terms of just how toxic it's become. So that one again, you can use it on your phone and on your desktop. So now I'll jump over to next one is LinkedIn. Anyone on LinkedIn? There's a few, that's good. Um, well, that's interesting because there's 15 million LinkedIn users in Australia as of last year. Yeah. So something like 55% of us are on LinkedIn. Again, the largest user group is the 25 to 34s. Um, we, we're not spending a lot of time on LinkedIn though. We're only spending about an hour a month. Um, almost 50-50 female and male users. Um, what are the key characteristics? It's the leading professional networking platform. It focuses on career development, networking and industry insights. It's ideal for business to business marketing, recruiting and thought leadership. There are some features there if you want to promote your business on LinkedIn, including company pages and groups and LinkedIn learning. So again, very similar to that commercial business model I was describing for, to Facebook, LinkedIn offers some of those features too. Next, examples of good practice in Melbourne. I won't go through these, but Deloitte has led the way um, for many years on social media in terms of being a leading enterprise. Um, to share industry reports, their thought leadership articles, and basically their findings and insights from their very own work. You know, for probably the last 15 years, um, one of the ways to grow an audience is to give them something for free. And when you're someone like Deloitte's, what you can give them is your knowledge. So that's what they've been doing to grow their audience. And I've also put in the Melbourne Business School there because I thought it may be of interest to some of you in this room, particularly with your quite strong user group here, just to see how they're doing it. Um, yes. But you can link through to those, You've all, you, can, you can click on those later, yeah? Otherwise, it, it will just be here forever. Not that I don't want to be, but we're, we're moving on. Um, the next one is TikTok. Okay, so TikTok is, uh, is the most explosively growing social media platform in Australia. Um, really young people love it. It's the leading mobile social media platform for Gen Z, which is your grandchildren or great grandchildren, and YouTube and Instagram are close behind. Um, originally an in, in, entertainment platform, it's now proving popular for politics, how to videos, and it's depending which country you're in, it's either the second or th third biggest search engine in your country. People search for stuff on. TikTok. TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, which bothers a lot of governments. Um, the key characteristics are that it's basically, it's, it's, it's Instagram with videos, right? So as Instagram was photos, TikTok is videos. 15 to 60 seconds featuring music, challenges, trends. Throughout lockdown, there was lots of dancing going on on TikTok. And then people would get their dads and mums to dance with them. So it was a bit of fun. It's really interactive. You can make your videos with other people. You can collaborate. So people will post videos where they're doing duets or they're dancing with someone else who's in another room. Or even more surprisingly, I think probably to many of us, is they have these things called reaction videos, which is a video of somebody watching a video. I know, right? So it's, it's Gogglebox, basically. Um, 
It's really strongly algorithm content discovery. So basically you choose a couple of things and it will keep serving to you stuff that looks and sounds like the stuff you already chose. Um, as you can imagine, if you are uh, uh, a, it, it, it's quite easy to mani manipulate that algorithm in some ways, because if you, for example, wish to promote misinformation about a topic, um, it's quite easy to get into the feed of people. So if somebody's clicked on, um, Vladimir Putin says that global warming doesn't exist, um, or, or pick a topic here, like it can be anything, that algorithm is gonna keep serving you more and more information like that. So you could be mistakenly, you could be mistaken in believing that that's actually the only content on that topic. Um, if you wanna have an experiment on that, try, Nuclear power, good or bad, uh, in the search bar. That gets interesting. Um, obviously, the USA gov US government is trying to force the owners to sell because they're concerned about um, privacy of data. Um, here's something frightening. Uh, Gen Z devotes approximately 8.1 hours per week to watching videos on social media platforms. Um, very much, very close 50-50 male and female. It is it is the currently the 25th most popular app, but it's the fourth most popular social media app. Um, eight and a half million Australians are active on it and their ads have the potential to reach something like 50% of our population who are over the age of 18. So um, there's some genuine concerns about it. There's also some really good fun happening there. Um, <coughs> I've given you a couple of examples here. Uh, this one is rather surprising. I just wanted to give you an idea of what it is. So let's go to Sticky Australia Confectionery. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so let's have a look at that first one there. Capybara lollies are back. So they make lollies and they make videos of themselves making lollies and they have seven and a half million followers. It is <coughs> one of the biggest TikTok accounts in Australia. And as she just said, they were bored during lockdown. They thought people might enjoy watching what they do and it's now passed into a, a, a very successful business for them. That's one of them. Um, <coughs> that's the kind of thing you'll see on TikTok. Um, you'll also see, I, I encourage you to go and have a look at it because there are some pretty strange things there. You can have a look at purple pingers next. Now, just in case you think you have to be beautiful to be on TikTok, not true. This is a guy who talks about housing. Um, you can see how old he is. <coughs> so he loves to talk about bad rentals and he loves to talk about housing. And you can see that, you know, there's something like 4,000 people clicked on and liked what he had to say there. So you can see that creating a topic of hot interest on TikTok can, <coughs> can get a lot of attention really quickly. Um, he's, he's now making a name for himself as being the guy that's the expert on dodgy rentals. But insert topic here. Um, create some videos and as you can see they're pretty amateurish like they're not um, they're deliberately designed to look amateurish as though he is sharing his thoughts with you as though it's not polished and that's that's a really deliberate choice of how he's doing that so there's that Twitter next okay who doesn't know anything about Twitter okay Wow, you are in for a ride. Um, <laughs> so Twitter is a platform known for its short content. When it started, you could only post 144 characters on there. So if you had something to say, you better say it good, you better say it short. Um, it was purchased by Elon Musk for an enormous amount of money and it's now moved into what you know, we call a freemium platform model. Some parts are free and then you start to pay. Um, for example, if you'd like a blue tick next to your name on Twitter, which means that you're verified, um, you're verified by paying Elon Musk $8 a month to have a blue tick. Um, 
The character count is now up to 280 characters, including the internet. Um, but it does promote concise information. So it's highly engaging during live events and news and trending topics. It was widely used, it's widely used by people on the ground in conflict situations um, who can get their stories out there quickly. Um, media, individuals, business and government agencies use it for updates, emergency updates and also customer service. You know, if you can't get through to Telstra on the phone, once upon a time you could get through to them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> not so much anymore. It also requires a very high degree of monitoring if you are using it for a brand or if you're a high profile individual. Um, it's uh, people who use Twitter are really, they really love Twitter. Um, they open it on average 72 times per month. That's nearly three times a day we're looking at it. Um, young people don't like it, they think it's for old people. Um, and uh, however, if you're over 18, there's about 25% of us that are on Twitter. The audience is about one third female and about two thirds male. There's some other characteristics of Twitter if you go to the next one. Um, Twitter is probably of the popularly available social media platforms, it's probably the most toxic one for offensive content. Um, it's a place where the new owner has championed free speech, but it has that has largely resulted in a flood of very unpleasant free speech. Um, it's it's so toxic that many mainstream media companies and journalists have left left because monitoring it and keeping up with the sheer amount of trolling that happens on that site is it could be it's a full time job to do that and some of the stuff is proper nasty. Um, I monitor a lot of social media accounts. Uh, Twitter is by far the one that occupies most of my time. I know that if I were to post on certain topics this evening, I'd probably be up till about two o'clock in the morning. If I was doing it on behalf of a client or heaven forbid an MP, um, I'd be probably up till two o'clock in the morning getting rid, of, taking out the trash basically. Because people feel that they can say anything and they do. Um, and the problem is that we also have a duty of care for what sits on our content and our feed so whilst you may be the thickest skinned person in the world, if other members of your audience are seeing nasty stuff, you've kind of got a duty to get rid of it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a horrible joint. Um, however, some people love it. You may love it. I used to love it to bits. I, I had, it was my happy home. Um, there's some popular accounts for a really strong, and obvious comparison, I suggest you go to Barack Obama versus Elon Musk himself. <laughs> so you'll see that there's really different types of content there. They're both very, very popular on Twitter. Um, but, um, you know, Elon, for example, is currently, today he's attacking the eSafety Commissioner in Australia for wanting to keep kids safe online. Um, Barack Obama, I think, is promoting youth leadership. So the only reason I've given you those two examples is to give you two ends, two ends of the spectrum. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but but I am. Um, and if you want to see how, 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 just how um, open-minded people think they can be, follow a little hashtag on on <coughs> Twitter called Ozpol where it's every person with an opinion on politics in Australia sharing that opinion with you. Um, <coughs> and you can, you can, you can, you can join, the, join the dots with some of that stuff. Another really good one on, on Twitter though is trending topics. <coughs> so you can check those out to just go and see what's interesting to other people and what other people are talking about. So when people say, oh my God, it was trending on Twitter, what it means is that Twitter publishes for you a sort of a ladder of the most talked about things and you can go and have a look at what that is if it's of interest to you. Finally, 
I've got some alternative and emerging platforms. Um, there's Blue Sky, I'm not sure who's on it, but I know you are. So Blue Sky is an alternative to Twitter, which is now called X. And it actually gives you control over the algorithm because it's open source, it's got a decentralized standard, and it means that you can, you've actually got some way to participate in what you see there. Um, there's another app called Mastodon, which is a very similar concept. Again, it's open source, and it was designed as an alternative to counter the, the Facebook algorithm, basically. Um, some other ones of interest, Reddit. Reddit used to be this kind of nerdy place where people would talk about um, movies and the Spider-Verse and that sort of stuff. Um, but it's now, so people share news stories and other content and they just vote it up or down. But it's now becoming a place where people actually post news stories first. Um, and it's easy to create an account. They don't really need you to give a lot of personal info. There's lots of communities for everyone based on special interests. And many of the top results of Google searches will go straight to Reddit because it's got a huge community there. So you might Google something and see Reddit as one of the results there. But generally people in there are really interested in their topic and they actually really want to talk about it and they really want to share that information and find out what others do. Um, Substack, you may or may not come across that. It's basically a blog that, it's, it's a blogging app, but it's got this handy feature that allows you to send your blog out in a newsletter, which old blogs didn't do. <coughs> so it means that people don't have to come, come, keep coming back and checking your blog. Um, lots of really interesting people on Substack. And then, media, uh, then Medium, which is another blogging platform, which is where lots of writers, journos, um, authors, content creators go to talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Excuse me. That concludes my short list of social media platforms. <laughs> but I'm happy to take questions unless you need to have a cup of tea or coffee and um, want to think about some of that or just shoot them at me. Larry will tell you what we're doing next. Well, I think we've got a, a few minutes for, for questions. Um, five? Five, five okay. minutes. Yeah, we've got a few minutes for questions and uh, uh, we need the microphone. I've actually been making notes, Michelle, so <laughs> stand by. Um, I'm, I'm waiting. Uh, first thing, what mo motivates that lady to do Sleep and Dusty? What's in it for her? Mm, okay, it's, I don't know because I don't know who she is. Um, she's selling something, so she's, she wants to get customers. Um, she, she's, a, she's making glass windows. So what she's doing is making glass windows more interesting to people and she's doing it in an appealing way. So I'd say she's got a business. Okay, she's, she has a product yeah. and the cash. Yeah, she's got a product, kind of she's flogging it. Okay, that's right. that point, yeah, thanks. Um, is, I, I, I use um, you, I YouTube. Always mix, no, I always mix up YouTube. Um, Facebook quite a lot. Yeah, you're right. But mainly with the special interest groups. Yes. So I sort of hang out on 3D printing groups and, yep. and electronics groups yep. and stuff like that. Yep. What, which other media have anything? I've seen a little bit of that on Reddit. Yes. Occasionally I Google for some question, yep. just general Google, and I'll find some posts about it on Reddit. But are yep. there any, what other groups have, uh, uh, media have groups in that? Instagram has kind of started to do it in that it can create, it's got channels now right. where you can choose people to come to your channel where you can, and your channels can either be two way or one way where you can broadcast to your channel or people can participate on your channel. But um, Reddit, Quora um, and Facebook groups are really still your absolutely strongest go-to places to share and exchange actual proper 
yeah. information with people. Yeah, core, core arch. I've, I've, yeah, I've got a friend in America who uses core. Of yeah, design. core is terrific. That gets pretty deep and meaningful at times. Yeah. It's serious yeah. people, not trivial people. Yeah. If I yeah, it is. I mean, it's people with... With due with, respect to the trivial people. Well, with high subject matter <laughs> expertise who who, yeah, yes. yeah. who yeah. Uh, understand that they're publishing their work yeah. there. Now, you've said something there about hashtags. Ah! And I, it sort of crossed my mind. It's a hashtag, a different way of, of flagging your interest in certain sort of topics. Yes. So where it came from was Twitter. So when Twitter was first launched, the only way they had of creating any kind of search was a bit of uh, sort of coding magic, which is to drop a hashtag with some words, letters behind it that allowed their fledgling app to sort information. So if you dropped a hashtag at the end of your tweet, you're saying, please sort it into the, basically sort it into that column. <laughs> um, and that's where it came from. There's obviously no central register of patch tags as such, no. so no, you can just make them up. Got to, got to kind of find. Yeah, you find you find the 3D ones. For me, three D printing. Say there are apps that will go and tell you what the most popular of hashtags are. Yes. Of course, there are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I think uh, thank you for the talk. You're yeah. welcome. Uh, John Hall's got his hand up. Uh, I put my hand down again, actually, but um, I just wanted to show <clears throat> our Facebook page if, if that would be possible. Um, would you allow me to do that? I don't have a problem with it. You'll need to ask your organisers. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, hopefully I'm sharing now. What's now, there it goes. Okay. Um, we do have a Facebook page, but we, we're not getting any hits on it. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's, if you'd like to have a look at it, Michelle, and tell us what we can do better. Um, so uh, I think we need to uh, up our game a bit, actually, in attracting people. We've only uh, attracted 59 members. Okay. So. so one of the problems you've got is is that it's a it's a it's a group. It doesn't have a business page, if you like. So is it? Is it a group that you have, as an individual, has set up and called Melbourne Creatives Collective? Or do you have a Facebook page called Melbourne Creatives Collective? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know enough about the, the subject to say it. I've, I've just joined this. That's from, my first observation. Uh, yeah, so, so from the company uh, as such. And, uh, but it's just... Um, you know, it's disappointing that we're not getting more people. I posted this, and I've I've, I've got three likes and about seven comments, but it's all always from the same people. So we're we're yeah, not because that's because you've got a that's because you've got a group of fifty nine people. So what's happening yeah. is that your posts aren't going into the general Facebook feed. Right. Um, it's it's only going to your group feed, basically. Right. So um, we, we really need to have somebody. Tell us how to you do. give ourselves more exposure. And I think you might be the person to do that, Michelle. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing. Card. I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Thanks, John. I'd, I'd probably happily give you a hand on that, John. Thanks very much. Uh, Tom Raddo's got his hand up. Yes, hi. Michelle, yeah. you mentioned uh, audiences who are adults. And I know, and I personally know that most of the young kids uh, from the age of eight onwards use social media. Now, what platform do they use? Uh, if they're eight, I would guess that they're using TikTok or Snapchat. Um, and uh, I could frighten you by saying some of them might even be looking at porn. Um, because that might be true, because um, they're really good at finding stuff online. What uh, but they're probably on Snapchat to... or Messenger or on TikTok. Okay, I think we've run out of... Sorry, up the back. Hello, my name's Anne and I was... Um, hello. I was wondering what, what your favourite... Platform is? Exactly, yes, please. Um, favourite. Look, I, 
if I'm looking at my own personal accounts, um, I'll look at Facebook and I'll look at Instagram. Um, the reason I look at Facebook is because my family are on Facebook. Um, I'll look at Instagram because uh, I follow a few funny accounts there, so I do it for a giggle. Um, but my probably my favourite social media platform is called the television. <laughs> because people can't interact with me there. Um, so I, I'd, it would probably be a streaming, t a TV streamer like, I don't know, Stan or Netflix or something like that. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the one I would most frequently visit would be Facebook and I'm well and truly in the age group of women who visit Facebook um, for exactly the reasons we do because my family are there. I have a question. Great. Who's that? Sorry, this was Fleur. I'm on Zoom with you. Um, I was actually wondering which platform you find the easiest to use. Ah, ah that's a really good question. Um, Twitter is easy, um, as long as you can be bothered with the – Twitter's easy. It's because it doesn't have tons and tons of functionality, so it's easy. Uh, Instagram, you can really do a lot of really good, fun, creative stuff there, but you've got to have tiny fingers and a really big screen to be able to make content on your phone on Instagram. But when I get it right on there, it does make me very happy. <laughs> so yeah, and Facebook's easy. Thank you. Michelle, thank you very much. When you, the first remarks you made were people were not using the conventional media, the newspapers and, and uh, so on for their information so much. And it's easy to understand why with so many different alternatives, uh, sources of information. And I must say that uh, only about one quarter of those that you mentioned it had I ever heard of. Yeah, that's right. So. Oh, there's more, there's more I wouldn't have heard yeah. of. I haven't even looked at the dark web, I promise. Hmm. I uh, used WhatsApp uh, uh, last week with a video, uh, a video phone call with a guy in Malawi, a, a friend who's uh, built a school there and I've been helping him a little bit. And uh, he took me on a 40 minute conducted tour of the school using the WhatsApp uh, uh, video link, which was fantastic, especially when you think that it's free. And, uh, but the only problem was that uh, it's, you can't record it. So we're going to do it, because there's other people who will be interested, we're going to do it again, but do it with Zoom. So it can be recorded, but uh, that's not quite the same as getting content. <coughs> you've been talking about. But, no, uh, and messaging, that whole messaging apps, we could do a whole other hour on that mm. alone. Because um, WhatsApp's gone berserk. We're also concerned about your cough. Sorry, and we've I bought you COVID. But we've, we've <laughs> bought you some medicine. Oh la la <laughs> and we hope it helps. And and thank you. Thank you. Oh that is definitely gonna help. <laughs> I feel better already. And thank, thank you, you, and thank you so That's much, beautiful. Michelle. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. Now it's time for a, a break. I think we can afford 15 minutes. And uh, we've got uh, coffee and nibbles up the back in the room. And Michelle, if you're yes. not racing off in a hurry, we have a little raffle and you might be asked to draw the first That's ticket. That right. So we'll see everybody in 15 minutes. Never happened. <laughs> My lifelong dream has come true. <laughs> uh, we've got Fleur Stevens who's online um, from our website Design Sig. Now, when Hugh put out the uh, memo to everybody, he said what she's going to talk about, but um, it'd be silly to, for me to tell you what she's going to talk about when in a minute you'll know firsthand anyway. So Fleur, are you there? Yes, I am. Well, um, over to you then. 
Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Fleur Stevens. I'm the convener of the website Design Seek. Um, and I've been doing it, I discovered for today for more than 20 years. I was like, ooh, although I'm thinking the COVID years don't really count. The world sort of stopped for a while. Anyway, first and foremost, I thought we could have a quick look at the things we discuss in the website SIG. So here goes. In our website SIG monthly meeting, we discuss all things website. And this is a very long list. So we start with domain names, web hosting and web hosts, design layouts of your actual website. Um, an example of this is spacing. So a website that has um, a lot of space, a lot of white space, um, gives the impression of being high end and expensive. However, a busy, busy, busy website with things everywhere and very cluttered um, gives the impression of things being quite cheap. Um, these are the sort of things we sometimes look at. Okay, also platforms for websites. So there are so many platforms for websites, um, whether it be out of the box, which is a good example of that would be Dreamweaver, where you um, have software that you use to create your website and then you upload it to your web host. Um, and alternatively, there are so many online platforms. So let's just go through some of the W's, WordPress, Weebly, Wix, and that's the W's. Other things, we spend a bit of time on image creation because websites, one of the majority of the content is at times images. Um, so our discussions range as to what sort of tools are you using, what sort of tools are you using. A lot of it though is simply chopping down images um, to a size that's suitable for a website, uh, discussing sizes that are suitable for websites and more to the point weights that are suitable for websites. So you don't really want to load up um, an image that's over a meg. Well, you don't really want to load up an image that's anything over 50K, really, um, because the heavier the image is, the more time it takes to load your website. And over the years, there's been many changes in the sort of images that we use on websites. So we used to use GIFs and JPEGs. Now we've moved into WebP. Um, WebP is a new image format that um, highly condenses the image size, so it's really fast to load. And of course, if your website is fast to load, you get more visitors, um, because visitors don't wait around very long for your website to load. I think these days it's something like three seconds. If your page isn't loaded by then, they're out of there. Um, yep, so obviously there are so many different bits of software you can use to do that. And when it comes to image development or even just chopping down the size, some software will do this, others will do that. So sometimes you can find yourself using quite a few different sorts of software. And then there's also image creation, actually creating an image from scratch. That's a whole nother world. Um, yep. But we do need to look at those things because we do all do those things when creating a website. So other things we look at, woo, installing web servers. So it sounds like, oh, no, I can't do that. But it's actually a really simple thing to do. It's just a bit of software you still install on your PC so that you can run um, a website locally. Now, what that means is you're pretty much the only one that will see it, but it's a place where you can build your website um, before you load it to the web. Uh, I would recommend software like Laragon and XAMP. They're fabulous. They're easy to install. Uh, they do the job. Uh, they also, for XAMP, it gives you a full suite of things. So PHP, MyAdmin, um, SQL. These are things that we often use when building websites, um, whether it's WordPress or whether we're just hand building a website, which doesn't happen so much anymore, but it still does happen. Which brings us to our next point, coding languages. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP. Um, sometimes we discuss them and sometimes we just use them. Um, we also have had a bit of a look over the years at the changes because, you know, as I said, I've been doing the SIG for 20 years. Over 20 years, things have changed. 
Uh, CSS is incredible these days. The things that you can do with CSS is amazing. You can actually build images using the CSS without having to use any tools um, other than code on the actual website. So that's a bit of fun. Uh, HTML, of course, has also changed over the years. Um, pretty much it's the same. We've got more tags. And with more tags, um, newer conventions, uh, things, ways to use code. So for example, when I first started, uh, websites were basically used, um, created using tables. These days we use an awful lot of divides, which is a tag. Um, and of course, search engine optimization. Websites would be nothing without search engine optimization. And over the years, that's changed and changed and changed and changed again. Google really kept us on our toes when it came to search engine optimization. And a lot of the tags we have in HTML um, are almost used specifically for the purposes of um, search engine optimization with Google implementing um, meta tags. Okay, now I thought we'd have a look at the, our last couple of meetings. So in the April monthly meeting, we looked at um, email templates as a method of jazzing up our emails. Now you might think, oh, Sorry, that doesn't Sarah, probably... are you sharing your screen at the moment? No. Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> you might think, oh, that has nothing to do with um, website building. But actually, creating email templates uses CSS and HTML. That's why I thought, yeah, we'll have a quick look at that. Also, when we do things like create um, websites, we often do things like create newsletters. So I thought it was also worth having a look at. We also looked at where to add your code in Hotmail and Gmail to ensure that the um, email presents in the way that you expect it to. Um, and I thought I'd show you just a quick thing that we are offered in our Gmail email. Um, let me just escape my notes. So in our Gmail account, if you hit Compose to create an email message, and in this email message, at the bottom of the screen where you have all of your tools, to the right-hand side, um, there's a thing that sort of looks like a layout. If we select that, browse layouts, it opens up our layouts. Can everyone see my screen or has it stopped sharing? Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Excellent. Okay. Um, so from here, you can choose any sort of layout and edit your layout. And from here, you've got a, quite a few tools that you can use to create a beautiful email. Um, so, for example, you've got text box, button, image divides, also content blocks. Content blocks are a fabulous way to um, quickly create something beautiful. So, whoop, drag and drop, or just click. And so from here, we can just edit what goes in it. Um, there's all, also quite a few more features. Spacers, spacer, social links, placeholders, and themes. From themes, um, normally you can change the colour of a, a theme, create your own theme. Yep, so that's a quick, simple, simple hack to make your emails better looking. Okay, and in the May monthly meetings, oh, sorry, in the May monthly meeting, we looked at AI and changes that that is making to website development. Um, one thing we had a quick look at was image creation. We looked at Copilot in Microsoft, um, as well as some other tools for AI image creation, where you basically just type in the image that you'd like and it creates something. So that was really fun. Um, we also looked at ChatGPT. It can make really, really simple websites, not websites I would ever use, but it's still interesting to have a look at. And speech to text, uh, where you can basically just talk to the computer and it'll type itself up, which is fabulous. Um, that makes things a lot easier, as well as um, you can then copy that into your chat GPT, type in your reword, and it'll come up with some beautiful text to pop in your website. So that was pretty fun. Um, what else was? Sorry. Ah, then it's generally followed by, oh, actually, there is one other really important thing. The legalities 
of looking at AI, of using AI images. Generally, if it's for a commercial website, you can't use the AI created image. Um, if it's a not-for-profit um, or educational, you can. It's just so long as it's not commercial, really. Uh, but that's generally the case with any free images, to be honest. After this, we generally do troubleshooting. This is where we do the actual work. Uh, we actively code our website. So whether it's um, looking at what is causing a layout problem and creating code to deal with it, um, or just sort of any problems people have with their websites or want to know about websites, uh, troubleshooting is generally when we do that. Okay, so I thought next we could move on to having a look at your free website that you get with your um, Melbourne PC membership, which is, of course, on sites. Uh, I think I've looked at sites years and years ago uh, in one of the monthly meetings. We're going to do it again. So here goes nothing. Going to share my screen. So here we are. It's really easy to get to your site. Uh, when, when you're logged in to your Melbourne PC account, simply go to the top where you've got the nine dots, top right-hand corner. Scroll down until you find Sites, which is a funny blue colour icon. And once we're in Sites, we can choose a theme. Um, ooh, what sort of thing do you want? Now nah, we'll go with red. I'm wearing a red jumper. I'm going to matchy matchy. Okay, so this is also a little bit like our email template creator in the tools that it has, where the tools are placed. So, of course, we've got text box images. Embed, uh, we might take the tour, why not? Okay, so add content. Use the insert menu to add content to your site. You can move content, change the size and crop images. Hmm, hopefully the cropping images is fast, never tried it. To organise your site, drag the content to where you want it. It's drag and drop, just like Weebly. Share your site to let others edit it with you. Mm, well, there's an interesting idea. I can't see how that could go wrong. And then publish. Okay, we've got it. So, again, it has these fabulous content blocks to make your website really good looking. Um, collapsible group is um, a menu on the best to probably show it. Let's scroll down after Sam Godwell and. There we go. So these sort of menus are often used for facts where you pop your question at the top and then the answer underneath. Place text here. Okay, how this works. Facts. Ta -da. Table of contents. Image carousel. Buttons, oh, let's put a button somewhere. Um, now, because I've chosen a theme, it does all of the colours. If I didn't choose a theme, then I'd be choosing um, colours. Um, not colours ind for individual components, colours for my overall theme. Uh, it's kind of limited that way, but it's great for building a really quick and reasonably good looking website. Plus it's responsive, so it it views well on mobile and tablet as well as desktop. So I can add in my social links, spaces, spaces are always needed, YouTube, calendar, maps, and also adding all of my um, Google account extras of docs, slides, sheets, forms, and charts. 
Now, I don't know if you've seen forms, but forms are a lot of fun. That's also a facility that your Google account gives you, as well as charts. And you can add extra pages. Oh, wow, our theme has a lot of pages. Oh, I was unaware of that. Um, as well as you can go to the themes page and make some changes. Okay, so next we might want to publish. Now that's interesting that it gave me a different address because it should have given me my name. So I'll just do Fleur's page. Copy publish site link, copy link, and let's have a look at the page. So that's the page, and I put some funny things in. And go to, I think we set that as the writing page, and here's the writing page. Wow, so that theme gave us the whole site. <laughs> Not a site that we want, but still something we can use to work from. We basically just change things, change the text, maybe change the images. And where does it have the responsive part? Might just change that to full screen, move this slide down. Um, I might go to home screen. I say that's back to edit. Settings. Ah, sorry, I keep moving my Zoom thing. Navigation. Brand images. So this is where we can upload our logo and our favicon. Favicum um, are the little things at the um, top of your tab, the little icons. So I'm not sure if you can see where I'm scrolling. That is the Favicum. Viewer tools, anchor links, analytics to see how your page is doing. Here is where you would place in your Google ID code. Announcement banner. Let's make a quick one. Button label, read more. Open in new tab or open in the same page. Visibility on home page only. Done. And of course, navigation. We've got navigation at the top. We could place it at the side. Not great options for navigation, top or side, but let's change it to the side and see what happens. Um, also might want to have a quick look at how it's going to display. So that is the side. This is the desktop view. That's quite interesting. I don't mind that. It's very old fashioned to have navigation at the side, but it's quite good looking. Um, and we want to go to the home page. Oh, there it is. Hi, welcome to my site. Read more. That's the banner. Let's have a look at desktop view. That desktop view. And um, we'll scroll down. So it's beautifully responsive, really, except perhaps the footer is a bit interesting looking. Mobile. View. Looks beautiful in mobile view too. So that's a tick for Google Sites. Office hours. Uh, 
Ah, this is fabulous. This is something that I wanted to look at. Okay, so this office hours request is a little something extra that Google gives us these days, which is Google Booking. Um, I've been trying to figure out how to use it because Google Booking is quite new to me. Um, but I'm guessing they've also used a form as well to, um, actually it should just be Google Booking. I'll tick to another page where I think I have Google Booking. Nope, that, not that one. Ah, somewhere. Nope, that's travel. Yeah, Google Booking. This is an introduction to Google Booking. So if you did want to use professional booking on your website somewhere, um, you could actually use your Melbourne PC account so long as you've got everything sort of linked together. And we'll go back to our site. Oh, where's it gone? Here it is. The published version. If I hit the cross, exit preview and go back to editor. Okay, so Google Sites is nothing to be scared of. It's super easy to use. It's one of the easiest tools for building a website. Um, in, unless you want a very specific sort of website, um, perhaps not the best for commercial websites. Still a lot of fun, really simple to use, very similar to Weebly. So I know a lot of people um, miss having their websites. Um, Ten years ago, uh, maybe longer, we uh, all Melbourne PC website members had access to create their own website, a little bit of server access. And I know when that disappeared, a lot of people missed it. So here's Google Sites. That's where you can build a site. Enjoy. I hope you build a site. Got any questions? Come to the website, SIG. We'll sort them out. Fleur, Fleur would you be kind enough to tell us when and where the SIG meets? Um, we're on Zoom and we're the fourth Sunday of every month um, by December. What time? Um, 2 to 5 p.m. Okay. Well, there's quite clearly a lot of expertise in this SIG. So... Uh, we cover people, a lot. It's people who are interested, you can look up the details on the <coughs> club's website and you would be very happy to see some new people join the... Sig, would you not? Yes, I'd love that. New faces are always welcome. Okay, we um, we like to close the meeting at the time we advertise, Fleur. So uh, we want to say thank you very much for coming and uh, giving us that presentation, and we hope that it's generated a bit more interest in your Sig. Great, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, next week we'll feature, next month we will feature a different SIG. Um, just in closing the, well, when I, we'll close the meeting formally, oh. but uh, Q&A will continue with either Harry or Cedric. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm here present. Yep. Very well. In, uh, in closing the uh, formal part of the meeting at any rate, I did want to uh, just share with you that as I was coming out tonight to leave, my neighbour brought <coughs> me up for a chat. Um, uh, I think he liked to talk to me because his wife won't talk to him. It seems like he, he said to her, if I die first, she said, would you marry again? And he said, well, I've never given that any thought. <laughs> I don't know, I suppose, if the circumstance is right, maybe, maybe I would. And she said, well, if you marry again, would she live in our house? And, and he said to her, well, I've never really given that <laughs> any thought, of course, but I suppose if I did marry again, it would make sense for her to live in our house. And then she asked, would she sleep in my bed? And he said, well, I've given no thought to this at all. I mean, I suppose if I did marry again and if she was living in our house, I suppose she would sleep in your bed. And she said, and would she use my golf clubs? And he said, no, definitely not. She's left-handed. <laughs> okay. 
So the meeting is closed, but Harry, um, those who have got questions online or... Yeah, no, I haven't got much to do. I did uh, advise that uh, uh, I won't be staying too long because I've got a fairly early start tomorrow morning, but I'll hang on for a few minutes. But just that uh, if there are any questions, we'll take them, but it doesn't seem like we've got a lot of questions. Perhaps people uh, ask all their questions at the SIGs that they go to. Yeah. Wow. I think you guys can have an early night. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I saw a, quite a nice session of the uh, last magazine. The uh, um, report from East SIG had uh, quite a lot of... Uh, 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 right up. Cedric, hello. Can I be heard? Is the sound check? Yes. Uh, okay. Question for you, Flo. Um, for a long time, I've been thinking of making a um, a website about nothing. Is there a is there a simple way of getting Google to pay for the electricity? You know, if you just flash up ads. Does Google see, Google send you a few cents? Um, if you if the ads get hit on, yeah. Um, you need to create a different sort of Google account. Well, you use obviously the account that you've got. Um, it's basically Google Ads. Right. And yeah, if yeah, so if you want to create a clickbait site, um, anytime somebody hits an ad, then yeah, you do get paid. Okay. It's not much though. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've actually met people that they have websites that specifically earn money from clicks. So yeah, some people do it. No, uh, just just as a starter, you know, out of yeah. curiosity. At least if the electricity is paid for, you lose nothing. I'm not sure how you do it in sites, but I think it might have something to do with embed. With what? Um, the embed button. So you hit the embed button and you can put in your own uh, oh, HTML see. or um, and that is probably where you um, add your Google ads in. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll try I've, something. Certainly, I've certainly put advertising on people's sites before. Yeah. So they have a secondary source of revenue, mostly just to pay for their own advertising when they advertise their store. Yeah. Yeah. I tried sometimes. Yep. Why not? Yeah. You've got nothing to lose. Never know where it goes. <laughs> I'm seeing Tom Rado's hand. I'd like to mention I had trouble with Thunderbird and uh, um, Dave uh, Simpson helped me to restore it, but I still have some problem. I will get in touch with uh, Dave uh, Simpson uh, regarding the background of my Thunderbird is all black. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I tried to change it and it wouldn't change. But anyway, I'll, I'll struggle through it. I think we've come from, from to the end, Harry. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for hanging about and doing that. Okay. I think uh, a lot of people belong to SIGs and uh, that's probably where they most people get their table their questions if not through iHelp. Good night everybody. <laughs>